Meet Brian Ireland, an employee of the city of Denver, Colorado. Brian is a tree trimmer. He takes care of trees. The major cation in, in those sheets... That you Meet have. Judy Eyes, also an employee of the city of Denver. Judy is an intensive care nurse. She takes care of people. A beginning tree trimmer, like Brian, earns about $14,000 a year. A beginning nurse, on the other hand, earns $13,000 a year, about 100 bucks a month less than the tree trimmer. Because nurses in Denver make less than tree trimmers, parking meter repair men, mechanic trainees, and some 50 other jobs dominated by men, Judy Ives and six other nurses filed a landmark discrimination suit in U.S. District Court. I felt that uh, nurses were underpaid and that for the caliber of work and responsibility that we were doing, that we should be making more money. They're just crybabies, you know. They need to go about it a different way. They were being paid more money than I was as a nurse, and yet I felt my job was just as important as their job. That's the, if they ain't good enough to make that kind of money, that's their own problem. If I didn't make good money, I'd move to a different job myself. I came up with the fact that it was probably because I was a woman and I was in a female-dominated profession. I don't even go to the doctor no more because the nurses look at you instead of the doctors, you know, and they don't know nothing. You know, they got the nurses doing the doctor's jobs. Maybe that's why they want to make more money. I don't think they're worth nothing. Uh, that most of the nurses are women, and 97% of us are women, in fact. So that I thought that probably had something to do with it, uh, that women tended to be paid less than men. A nurse and a tree trimmer. Two people, two jobs, different sex, different salaries. The nurse says she's undervalued, underpaid. The tree trimmer says, too bad, lady, I do dirty, dangerous work. And their employer says they're both wrong. The marketplace determines what you're paid, and I'll be darned if I'm going to compare the two of you. This rather novel idea involving the value of traditionally women's work in relation to traditionally male jobs is called comparable worth. Already, 13 countries are grappling with the issue. In Canada, comparable worth is a matter of law. In the United States, 11 states are studying the issue, and the Supreme Court, acting with unusual haste, is poised for a test case. As the last frontier of civil rights law, comparable worth has already sent shivers through the courts. It's a new rallying cry for women and the scorn of some of the nation's largest employers. A Supreme Court ruling could well be a landmark decision with implications for millions of women and a billion dollar price tag for business. As we just saw, comparable worth somehow seems to outrage all of us. It challenges our perceptions of women and the underpinnings of the free market. We have to admit that comparable worth is hardly a household phrase. But the issue has two ingredients that promise to spice up almost any evening, sex and money. We'll begin our story in just a moment. This is the face of determination. Some might call it liberation. The collective sway, the proud stride of 45 million American working women, leaving home, leaving the past, going to work. A new wave of working women the most important migration of workers in American history. A sudden surge of women leaving the bottom and heading for the top. Since 1960, the number of working women in America has doubled. Today, nearly two-thirds of all women between 16 and 65 are working, most of them full-time. And reasonable estimates say virtually all women will be working by the end of the century. As this tide of working women reaches the shores of a male world, the floodgates are falling away. Today, women have broken the barriers to education. They've jammed medical and engineering schools, entered the crafts and skilled trades, and flocked toward professional life. More than a tenth of all lawyers and judges are women, 
And of all the management positions in America, more than a quarter are held by women, some of whom rub shoulders with the county or corporate board. In all, women are climbing both telephone poles and corporate ladders with ease, style, and grace. As a statement of just how sweet it is, recent public opinion polls say most of us believe women have made it. Equal opportunity, equal pay, and a fair deal are here to stay. Discrimination is on the way. And if anything is still out of whack, it's that men feel they are the victims of reverse discrimination. Undressed, perhaps, by the success of so many women. In a scant 20 years, thousands of women have found their place in the American workforce. The bacon they bring home is thick. And along with a fat paycheck has come new status, new clothes, a line of credit, a new home, an open door at the bank, and an invitation to join the country club. But for most working women, bread and roses are hard to come by there is still the feeling that most ain't satisfied. For them, the dream is still a dream. Their slice of the American pie remains rather slim. The U.S. Department of Labor says the average woman works because she has to. Working is not a luxury or a matter of choice. Most women work to support themselves, their children, or their husbands. The number of single, widowed, or divorced working women with children is rising rapidly. Women who head households earn, on the average, about $8,500 a year. Most women work in low-pay, low-prestige, dead-end jobs, the pink-collar ghetto. Nine out of 10 working women earn less than $15,000 a year. A growing number of working women, especially minorities, live at or near the poverty line. Unemployment rates for women are consistently higher than they are for men. And even with a college education, women grads will make $2,000 a year less than the average male high school dropout. To a great extent, the earnings power of women today, the value of women's work, is rooted in the past. Contrary to what many of us believe, women have always worked. As pilgrims, pioneers, and prairie settlers, women were productive as well as reproductive members of society. The early American home was as much of an economic unit as it was a social one. Men and women depended on each other. They worked side by side, day in, day out, in partnership for survival. No one questioned the value of a woman's work. She was a full and equal partner in an agrarian family business. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution, however, the nature and value of work for men and women began to change. Up until the late 19th century, clerical work was done by men. Men eager to learn a business and advance. The job paid well. But with the invention of the typewriter, supposedly nimble-fingered women were welcomed into the office. Clerical work became routine and mundane. Women were viewed as temporary employees. And office work began to lose value and prestige as a stepping stone to success. As industry dotted the landscape, more and more men left the farm, left home, in search of paychecks. Few women went with them. Those who did were generally poor immigrants and blacks, women who had to work. For those women who did work outside or out of the home, a job was more an extension of domestic duty, the nurturing and supportive role. Women were seamstresses, dressmakers, laundresses, teachers, and nurses. There was little pay and little prestige. With the dawn of the 20th century, more and more women entered the workforce. Most were young, single, mobile, and poor. The fringe of the working class. And World War I opened for the placid women of America unprecedented channels to assertiveness. Even through the First World War, with new opportunities, only one out of ten women worked. 
1931, the average typist was paid $12 a week. And through the 20s and 30s, with still more jobs to be had, most women remained in the home, raising families and celebrating a new deal. With the onslaught of war in Europe, American industry tooled up for the military machine. Men left for the trenches. Women flooded the factories. And for the first time, many women came face to face with blatant pay discrimination, on-the-job harassment, and unsafe working conditions. But for the most part, Rosie the Riveter became one of the best paid women in history a valuable part of the war economy. After the war, women left the factory as abruptly as they came in. They had to. They were, in effect, fired by a combination of political and social policy and sent home. Instead of rivet guns, women were told to wave banners, wear bobby socks, tune in to bebop, and make babies. Along with this forced exodus, women lost a status, they lost power, they lost money. Those who wanted and needed to work had to settle for what remains today as women's work, clerical service and unskilled factory jobs. Higher paying work was left for Johnny as he came marching home. Following the war, a woman's place was soundly established, ingrained in the national psyche by a potent new medium. Get something in your head, Alice! I'm the king here, remember that! This house is my castle! I'm the king! Remember that! King, king, king! You are nothing! A peasant! This is my house, my castle! I'm the king! <laughs> As the 50s settled on the cultural horizon, more and more women went to work. But as Hollywood reminded us, position and power remained the province of the man. If you plan on working for me, stop looking like small town librarians. Fix your hair, put on higher heels, shorter skirts, and happier looks. Bring your books. Even today, in the more egalitarian 1980s, the line between past and present seems blurred. The vast majority of American parents still believe a mother should work only if she has to. Couple all of this with a single point. The majority of women, 80% in fact, work in low-paying clerical, service, retail sales, and unskilled occupations. Few women have careers. Most have jobs, jobs taken or clung to amidst the swirls of inflation. Shrinking dollars pull on women like an undertow. Few are keeping their heads, much less their families, above water. Doris Mendel is one such woman, a longtime secretary at Austin Community College in southeastern Minnesota. Doris and 11 other clerical workers filed one of the first comparable worth discrimination complaints in the United States. There are things in my department that we do with personnel. We fill out the forms. We handle insurance matters. We handle the teacher retirement affairs. Uh, there's a thing that Governor Perpich uh, instigated called Forms Reduction. I happen to be the Forms Reduction designee. And I'm also what they call the Personnel designee. We have a lot of titles. Uh, we'd like to see them reflected in our paychecks. About half the employees at Austin are clerk typists. What triggered the complaint was an across-the-board reclassification and pay raise for janitors giving janitors about a dollar an hour more than secretaries. Even then, the women realized that they had responsibilities that seemed to surpass those of the janitorial staff. We didn't have a feeling that the janitor should not receive this salary. And that was never present as far as uh, the women at the college were concerned. We just felt that someone with the experience uh, that you need to type, take shorthand, even uh, meet the public just has to have a little more expertise and should be paid accordingly. Alice Tom Have, an account clerk responsible for cash transactions and a 15-year employee of the college, also signed the complaint. Why should he be given uh, 
a monetary gain without turning around and looking at the lower rated female job. A matter of pride, our job is as good as their job, and uh, we don't begrudge them the raise, but we feel that we were being cheated. I, I myself was a woman alone at that time, and I was acutely aware of how far money would go. I knew that a dollar for a man was needed uh, for a woman as well. I think that uh, they do not look at an overall picture. They look at uh, a girl starting out and, oh, well, she's going to be married. She doesn't need this. And then uh, if she's a married woman and has a husband, well, it's supplemental. And I think this has something to do with it. The woman's job is always considered just that. In the home, often, a woman's job is not given a value. And probably that carries over into the marketplace. The comparable worth complaint in Austin, Minnesota, was but one of two such challenges to state law. Now, the other was in Washington. Already, two states, Massachusetts and Wisconsin, have some form of comparable worth language on the books. There have been two out-of-court settlements involving the issue, amounting to more than a million dollars in back pay. As we shall see when we resume our story about clericals in Austin and nurses in Denver, the concept of comparable worth is not only a matter of what is legal or illegal, it's a matter of what is economically and morally right or wrong. In the South, the slaves were led to the new flaming spirit of liberation. Harriet Jonason has been a clerk in the audio-visual department for 13 years. Sympathy for her and other women at Austin was strong both at the college and in the community. Letters of support came from Walter Mondale and Hubert Humphrey. The original complaint was actually written by a college administrator and sent to the state human rights department. Doris Mendel and the 11 other women who signed the letter did so for themselves, but also they say for more than 200 women employed in the state college system, some of whom were on welfare. When we... Um filed our case, our case wasn't really just for us alone, it was for these other women, as well as, as our daughters or our, our younger sisters. We were fighting for women. The initial complaint was filed in 1972. At the time, most clerk typists and stenographers made between four and five hundred dollars a month. Most of the jobs held by men paid between five and six hundred dollars a month. The feeling of something being wrong started uh, before 1972. So when we filed the complaint, we really um, were very well aware that, that things weren't equitable. When we visited Austin, male maintenance workers were reluctant to talk with us about pay raises. The State Civil Service Commission, which employs college personnel, did say reclassification and raises were necessary. At a small college, janitors are needed to do a variety of tasks. Thus, the new titles, new duties, and pay increases. The state also said the raises were relatively small, about 4%, and given to men only because the janitors happened to be male. It just so happened that we were all women. And, and we, when you know something is not right, I think you have to be pretty dead not to object. At the time of the complaint, only seven of more than 200 clerical workers earned as much as the starting level buildings and groundskeepers. Of more than a dozen senior stenographers, some of whom had budgetary and supervisory responsibilities, six were paid less than maintenance personnel. One of the women here at the college said when we first started our case that um, she thought that it was generally thought that we women worked just to buy our own pantyhose. Uh, and you've often seen the article say that we are thought to work for pin money, and this just isn't the case because many of us are heads of household and we need a livable wage. As a veteran employee with an associate arts degree and now secretary to the president, Doris Mendel is responsible for payroll for the entire college. The image of a secretary is often, uh, well, that's a girl that uh, types and answers the phone. And that isn't uh, what we're about here. 
For the state of Minnesota, the cost implications were potentially enormous. The complaint could have set an expensive precedent for other campuses in the state system and thousands of state clerical employees. There were rumors of high-level politics and, Doris claims, occasional on-the-job harassment. We were told that we could be replaced any minute, and we were told that we were a dime a dozen. We've been told that if we don't like our jobs, we should be janitors, and we feel that that's offensive. It's also illogical. Uh, should we all be janitors and then call the problem solved? Finally, after two years and the rumored intervention of then-Governor Wendell Anderson and other high-level officials, the complaint was dismissed. The Human Rights Department said there was absolutely no evidence of any violation of state law. No authority to attempt to equate different jobs. No law, in other words, upon which to compare the skill, the responsibility and effort of a secretary with that of a janitor and thus prove discrimination. The result of this would be that I would say, judging from myself, that I feel a feeling of hopelessness. And the hopelessness comes from the fact that in Minnesota we seem to have a legal system that really does not support the average person. And that's what I would say we women were, the average working women. The Human Rights Department did advise Doris and the others to pursue their complaint in federal court. They did, but the complaint was again dismissed for failure to state a claim. I think the jobs that are predominantly female jobs uh, have to be recognized and paid more. It's, a, it's just a pattern that has been accepted in the past, but it is just that, an old-fashioned concept, and we have to move forward. There's a lot of women that need to have livable wages now. Not too far from Austin, Minnesota, at the University of Northern Iowa, secretaries and librarians brought a similar comparable worth suit in 1976. In the suit, a secretary with the same job classification, same labor grade in the same union, and same seniority earned $2,400 a year less than a male painter. A female librarian, again with the same university classification status, same labor grade and same union, same seniority, made a thousand dollars a year less than a man in the boiler room. Despite a consultant's report saying the job should pay about the same, the university argued it should pay only what it has to in accordance with the laws of supply and demand. Federal District Court in St. Paul ruled against women at Northern Iowa on technical and legal grounds. I was as valuable, as competent, and as much worth as a man. In a more recent pay equity case, Alberta Gunther, a jail matron in rural Oregon, wants equal pay for work that is not the same, but of comparable value to that of male guards. I think they paid less because we were women, pure and simple. They considered our job of uh, less value, of less worth. And so therefore they could pay us less. Larry Durr, an attorney for Alberta's employer, that, uh, believes the, the case could have a disruptive inflationary effect. That if it became necessary to raise the pay, whether it was done on a piecemeal basis or not, of all female employees in the country, so that the end result was that the median pay, the average pay for women was the same as men. The cost factor alone is something that I'd, I don't think the economy can bear. A federal appeals court did not rule on the salary differences, but in an important point of law, the court said Alberta's claim is covered by the Civil Rights Act. An appeal by the county is pending in U.S. Supreme Court. Considering the extra duties that I performed, I possibly was of greater value to my employer. He did not have to uh, hire an extra cook to fill in on the cook's days off because he had me. In Washington, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is charged with enforcing Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, in As in former the chair of the agency, uh, Eleanor Holmes uh, Norton has led the comparable worth fight, holding hearings and filing briefs in key comparable worth suits. It would have been impossible for this many people of this gender to come to work for the first time without over time uh, looking around them and suspecting 
that there was something at work in their wage setting other than uh, the merits uh, and the ingredients of the jobs. They, they do, and I think those who think otherwise give women, who are after all intelligent beings, too little credit. All of the attention paid toward comparable worth, though, has hardly come from just one side. Continental Bank in Chicago, the nation's seventh largest, is actively opposed to the concept. The Vice President for Personnel Management, Owen Johnson. I do not believe you can measure the intrinsic worth of a job. I do not believe that, that productivity can be objectively measured for very many jobs in our society. So the concept of worth to me is almost mystical. It, it defies concrete definition and objective measurement. Continental Bank is but one of more than 150 of the nation's largest employers who are fighting the comparable worth concept. The companies and trade associations are all members of a group called the Equal Employment Advisory Council, headquartered in a Washington, D.C. law firm. Mr. Johnson is a member of the board. Further, I really don't believe our system, our economic system, is set up to determine a job's worth or to pay a job according to its intrinsic worth. Our whole concept with the market system in this country is to pay according to the forces, the economic forces of supply and demand. The membership list of the council known as the EEAC is secret. The group reportedly includes though Prudential Insurance, Exxon, Sears, General Electric, IBM, AT&T, U.S. Steel, General Motors, and at least two large trade associations, the Edison Electric Institute and the Rubber Manufacturers Association, as well as Continental Bank. I believe that the, the view that any arbitrary increase uh, in salaries unrelated to market forces would be extremely uh, costly and uneconomic for us is widely held among people in the business community, both workers as well as the people who are running the particular businesses. Dues for the council are reportedly $5,000 a year, the budget in excess of $1 million a year. The council will not talk publicly about comparable worth, but with $130,000 from the business roundtable, the council financed a book. The editor, a professor in the Harvard Business School, Dr. E. Robert Livernash. Nobody up until this point ever tried to argue that market rates were fair, equitable, non-discriminatory. Market rates were just market rates. They were impersonal. Maybe they reflected discrimination. They certainly reflected, certainly reflected friction. I don't think that the market is equitable or uh, unequitable, fair or unfair. The market is merely reacting to supply and demand forces. I think the rate that they're paid, the wage, the salary, reflects market conditions, reflects market. And I don't think you can call market rates discriminatory. Are we to say to, for example, women in a country that has great need for secretaries, that so long as you choose that occupation, you must abide unequal and illegally unequal wages. In order to get what you are truly worth, you must choose some other occupation. That doesn't sound right to me. Everybody thinks the job they're working on is damn skilled. It's one of the highest skilled jobs going. You ask a janitor and he'll tell you how, to, how you manipulate a broom. We all have different value systems. Whose value system would be used to determine how jobs should be ranked? I really don't know. I would opt to use the market because the market preserves the maximum amount of personal freedom uh, relative to a central planned economy, more like that of the Soviet Union. How are you going to judge these jobs in terms of their intrinsic skill, their intrinsic responsibility, their intrinsic working conditions? You tell me, which is worse, a hell of a bad stink or a loud noise? As the so-called paycheck challenge of the 80s, Owen Johnson and a host of other voices see comparable worth as an ill-defined concept, disruptive of wage control, and a costly challenge to the free market. This book also says any earnings gap between men and women is the result of unions. 
educational differences, years at work, overtime, and the kinds of jobs women take. Wage discrimination, the book concludes, is for the most part an unprovable assumption on the part of women. To test these theories, we put the question to the public. Why is it that men, on the average, earn much more than women? I guess they're just stuck with the past because I suppose they haven't been there before. Well, principally tradition, I guess. I think part of it is education. Missy, Winkle, stay home, have babies. Maybe because most of the top executives are men. The men are the ones that are setting the wages. We have a double standard. They're not given a chance. Discrimination. The chauvinistic world. Many jobs women can't do. Because women aren't, aren't, uh, aren't skilled enough. This, uh, more intelligent, smarter, I believe. Smarter, more intelligent. Okay. Yeah, and they run the country where a woman could. Plus the fact that there are many male chauvinists around. This is Trenton, New Jersey, settled along the Delaware River in the industrial northeast. For more than six years now, a Westinghouse plant in Trenton has been the subject of what legal experts say is the most significant comparable worth suit in the country. Nearly 80% of the workers at this light bulb assembly plant are women. Since the 1930s, women say they were channeled into what the company actually labeled as female jobs. Mary Clink is president of the local union and an employee of Westinghouse for nearly 40 years. If you're doing the work and you have the skill to do it, you should get paid the same amount of money as the man is getting. And I think that's where the comparable work comes in. They're doing the work, but they're not getting the money. Georgia Gutschall has worked at Westinghouse for nearly a quarter of a century, initially assigned, she says, to a low-paying female job. There was just no advancement, nothing that, w that we could do about it. And I, like I said, I felt locked in that and I didn't think it was fair. Representing women at the Trenton plant is the International Union of Electrical Workers headquartered in Washington, D.C. Wynn Newman is general counsel for the union and has represented electrical workers in dozens of comparable worth cases for more than 11 years. It is incongruous to pay a job that has greater skill effort and responsibility less than another, which requires less skill effort and responsibility. And the only justification for it in industry and in various establishments is that women are occupying the higher skilled job. Four out of ten union members are women. And over the past 11 years, IUE investigators say high percentages of women were assigned to low-paying jobs in much of the industrial sector. If Westinghouse is not unique, the situation is, abounds galore in all kinds of other industries. One of the first comparable worth suits brought by the IUE resulted in a million dollar out of court settlement. The suit was brought against another Westinghouse plant in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The Fort Wayne situation clearly opened our eyes to what was going on throughout the industry, that women in virtually every plant were being hired at lower rates than men were being hired at for jobs that required equal or greater skill than the jobs men were being hired at. For example, we found that women who are doing quality control work, which involves complex electronic blueprint work, were getting paid less than men who were hired off the street to sweep the floor. But it's the Trenton case which has brought the IUE both national and international attention. The crux of the case is the company's classification system. Even after male-female labels were removed, the IUE claims, the company continued to assign women to low-paying jobs. All of the jobs in the plant were evaluated and point-rated according to Westinghouse's own appraisal of inherent worth. Westinghouse, the IUE says, continued to pay women less, even though its own studies showed that women's jobs often required similar, if not greater, skill, effort, and responsibility than that of a man. The companies contend that these jobs had to be occupied by women, the assembly line jobs, working with fine wiring, sometimes so thin you couldn't see it with the naked eye, because females had finger dexterity. And as was, but while recognizing that special talent, if they had that, the companies then determined to, to uh, compensate the females for the extra talent by paying them less. 
John Madalena, a Westinghouse employee for 30 years, observed many of the alleged pay differences. The female janitor cleaned the ladies' room, and the male janitor cleaned the male uh, men's room, but he got paid a higher labor grade than her simply because it was man and woman. I think they're making money on women. I think they're just, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's secretary or, or uh, plants or whatever, uh, they're saying, oh, they're only women, so therefore we can start them at a lower, a lower labor grade. Marge Brophy, a 35-year employee, took a traditionally man's job as part of a partial out-of-court settlement of the suit. Yeah, that's what I tell them, too. I tell all the men, boy, I'm in your racket now. I said, you guys had it good for all these years, and I'm joining you guys. And I really seriously mean it. I never had it so good. I love it. I can do the job. There's times that things are a little difficult, but all you've got to do is use common sense. And women have just as much common sense as men. And I submit that Westinghouse, is, as I said, is not unique. It's traditional throughout most of industry, wherever women have been employed in traditionally female jobs. Westinghouse says its pay system is not illegal. And in federal district court, Westinghouse asked for and received a summary judgment. Case dismissed. But in a major advance of civil rights law, an appeals court ruled against Westinghouse. The court, in effect, said it is illegal to set salaries for females lower than males if both persons perform jobs of comparable worth. There is the basic prejudice where men, men who are the dominant force in the, high, in the hierarchy of, of management, uh, look at the male role as being the more significant role, and they still think as males, and they think of, of the surrounded by males, the leadership are males. Uh, and if you have to lift something, that makes the job uh, so much more valuable than if you don't have to lift something. Westinghouse denies any intent to discriminate. The company is appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court and has declined to comment publicly on the case. Women didn't choose to go into the so-called women's jobs that they now occupy. Employers and society made that determination for the women, and they went where they could go and where they would be employed. People, as I mentioned before, have a right to be paid for work they're being performed at the rate it's worth, and employers have no right to be unjustly enriched because they choose to employ women rather than men and get a bargain rate out of the, uh, off the backs of the women. Legal insiders say the IUE Westinghouse case is the most important in the U.S. right now. A favorable review by the Supreme Court could trigger a flood of costly cases waiting in the legal wings. The Associate General Counsel for the IUE, Carol Wilson. Employers and most people will readily admit that if these disparity in wages were based on religion or based on race, or national origin, there would be no question not only that it violates the law, but that it would be uh, clearly immoral. Even an appropriate... The EEAC, a collection of large employers, is watching the IUE suit closely. The vice president of Continental Bank and an EEAC board member, Owen Johnson. I believe that any arbitrary salary adjustments independent of market forces simply result in economic inefficiency and we're already at a point with our own economy where we really can't stand any economic inefficiencies if we're to remain competitive on a worldwide basis with other countries that are now threatening our economic dominance. A price tag can't be put on the cost of, of discrimination and while employers argue about how much it would cost None of them are frank enough that I know of to state what's really involved. What they're really saying when they say it will cost too much to correct it is that we want to continue to discriminate because we don't want to, we want to save the money that correcting it will, will involve. And I don't think our society is built on saying discrimination is okay, providing it doesn't, if it would cost a lot to correct it. There's an oversupply of women. An oversupply performing relatively few jobs, to me, very simply implies relatively low wages. No one else created this discrimination in wages 
but the employers themselves. And we think uh, it would be a sad story indeed if our economy could only succeed by allowing employers to continue to discriminate. For Marge Brophy, Mary Klink, and Georgia Gutschow, a favorable ruling could mean back pay, new jobs, and a bold new legal precedent. Women now, they're self-supporting. Men no longer feel responsible for you. And then there's a lot of women that never get married. What about all those women? And they were doing all these jobs and then getting lower labor grades. So, you know, the women, they had to make us just as much money as men. They know that it's coming. They knew for years that this change was coming. And still to this day, they are just holding off. But for Owen Johnson, such settlements are short-sighted. Solution to that, I think, is consistent with the free operation of the market which is to encourage mobility out of those jobs into many other jobs which might offer higher salaries. But this is not the issue here. The issue is the women are doing the same, if not more responsibility, more skills than the men, and are not getting paid for it. To talk about 80% uh, moving into non-traditional jobs, uh, uh, sounds very good, uh, and uh, as Mr. Newman said, uh, uh, we hope that will be accomplished in the long haul, but it's a very, very long haul. It will take hundreds of years to do that, and these women who are occupying these jobs now have the right to be paid a fair wage for the job they're doing, and that's not happening now. Owen Johnson is hardly alone in his fight against comparable worth. Numerous employers, trade association, and chambers of commerce oppose the concept. The Wall Street Journal invokes the laws of supply and demand and says women who advocate comparable worth are, and we quote, interfering in the labor market. Fortune magazine says comparable worth will cost this country $150 billion in back pay. This, Fortune says, will have enormous inflationary effects. Those who favor the concept, Fortune says, will upset myriad long-established business practices. In a moment, we'll travel to Denver, where a group of nurses launched yet another comparable worth challenge. Denver, Colorado, a friendly, progressive city busting its britches along the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Brian Ireland is one of hundreds of city employees keeping Denver neat and clean. A hard-working, well-paid tree trimmer and proud of it. And I don't know how many cuts and scratches and scars I got, you know? A lot of tree trimmers, they ain't getting no fingers, they ain't got no arms, they're mangled. I said it's, risk, it's dangerous work, you know? That's why we get paid this. Tree trimmers and an array of male-dominated jobs were the object of a comparable worth suit brought against the city by seven nurses. The nurses argued that jobs held mostly by men paid more than jobs held mostly by women. Right. Ann Jumper, one um, of the original plaintiffs. It's not the kind of discrimination where somebody has done something to me. It's, it's the issue of, instead of asking the question, what am I paid, how am I paid? On what basis am I paid? The city of Denver sets wages for Brian and other city jobs by picking a group of key jobs, surveying the community, getting a sense of the going rate, and then fitting all remaining jobs into a salary scale. That system was established by males. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't you think that would be um, a little frightening to have a bunch of upstart females say, there's something wrong with your system, sir? A team of personnel professionals determine salaries for the city. Clyde Hawking is the head of the team. It uh, has nothing to do with sex. Uh, I could wonder why maybe I wasn't being paid as much proportionately as a tree trimmer was in, in, in a, what you might call a white collar position. And I think male or female, everybody has this argument. Another plaintiff in the suit, Caroline Lark. You say there is a, that it, you can't see it. But I think that that's, that, that I'm not speaking down to you or anything, but I think men wear blinders. Because I think to us it is obvious. 
somebody who is doing something else that I think doesn't require as much, you know, background and brains and what have you as I do, is making more money. I don't believe I'd put a sexual connotation on it. We see it every, t every time we get paid. We see it all the time. In all my years in classification and pay, there has never been a time that I can think of where you haven't had certain classes of people, nothing to do with sex, who have felt they were underpaid. But all I want is, is that I want to be paid for what I feel my male counterparts being paid. It ticks me off, you know? Like, what, you know, why are they knocking us, you know? He said, I think, I think we should get paid more, not less. A lot more. And that, that Judy Eyes, an intensive care nurse and key witness in federal district court. Uh, the complexity of people who are entering hospitals is much higher than it used to be. And so their nursing needs are higher. When I was in intensive care, I seen a few of them helping doctors jumping up on the bed, you know, trying to get guys alive. But they don't do nothing to me that looks very hard. It seems as though as medical technology has advanced, the more has been required of nurses, and we have adapted to the changes. You don't know what they're doing either, you know. They might be working when you're watching them, but they probably go down, take a break, loaf around, swipe all the drugs. They don't save anybody's life anyway. It's the doctor's one that does most of the work. I'd love to they're have helpers. them come to work That's with all them. they are, is helpers. As far as I'm concerned, that's my opinion of it. A nurse is a helper. So I can't say that what I do in a critical care unit as a nurse um, is handing out bedpans and uh, answering a light. I'm doing a whole lot of other very sophisticated skills in the absence of a physician. To prove the city system was discriminatory, nurses worked with their attorney, Craig Barnes. You could just tell that there was an injustice if women were being paid at such a low level, there ought to be a way to find relief for that. And you could take the director of nursing service and compare her to people with a similar kind of education and supervisory responsibility and experience and see such dis gross disproportion. Ask yourself if there's why that's happening, and they, we couldn't. One, two, what now? Go! After studying virtually every job, nurses said jobs held mostly by men even ones requiring less education, skill, training, and experience, on the whole, paid more than jobs held mostly by women. I came up with the fact that it was probably because I was a woman, and I was in a female-dominated profession. And for my part, no, they, they have all they have coming. It's because of what Judson Lauer is the superintendent of vehicle maintenance. Our, our qualifications, our abilities, the techniques that's involved in keeping the rolling equipment, all the heavy equipment, is far exceeds that of a nurse. If someone said to me that nursing is an honorable profession and why are you doing this, um, I would have to say that if it's an honorable pro profession, why is it not paid as if it were an honorable profession? Where I might have need for a nurse for as much as, say, a five-day stay in any given hospital and maybe under some watchful care they might provide, I dare say that same nurse would have a far greater need for a mechanic to keep their motor vehicle running for the transportation to and from their own job than we would have their own services. They wouldn't be working if it wasn't for guys like us getting hurt going in there and getting work done, you know? I hate to keep saying it over again, but you just there's no comparison between nurses and tree trimmers. Over a four-year period, nurses took their complaint to the city council and the personnel department. They were rebuffed by both. It was my contention, and it is my contention, that they were paid comparably to other city, other city jobs. We took about six months to analyze all the records we could get our hands on without subpoena power and without working at it. And in that six months, we found these blatant discrepancies. We couldn't figure out why, except for sex. The sex of the employee seemed to be the only factor that was different. I have 800 classes involved in this city, and I defy you to go out and find more than a half a dozen of them who feel they're being paid what they are worth. I felt that um, nurses were underpaid and that for the caliber of work and responsibility that we were doing, that we should be making more money. I, my reaction was to that, you chose that position, you chose that classification, you chose that occupation. I just, I don't recall that there was a lot of, of uh, choices to choose from at that time. 
Or at least I didn't feel there was. I mean, it, it would never cross my mind to, to be a physician or to be a lawyer or uh, to go into business. You know, secretary, teacher, or nurse is what I thought. She chose to become a nurse. She chose not to become an engineer. Herb Abshire is a labor lawyer and director of the city's personnel department. I can't comment on paid what they're worth because I don't know what the term worth means. If you mean, are they paid based upon what they are willing to work for throughout the entire community, I have to say yes. You can compare education, and you can compare the nurse's experience, and you can compare the number of people that are supervised, and they would be, have the same number of years of education or more. They would supervise a great number of people. They would have had five or 10 or 15 years of experience. And they'd be paid less. Uh, any employer looks at what does it cost to attract and retain competent people to perform the work that is available. We look at the marketplace. What are nurses uh, getting in the way of wages versus other occupations? That, in the final analysis, is the thing that we look at. The city of Denver could not go out and say, let's find out what blacks are paid in the metropolitan area and base our salaries for blacks in city employment on the low range uh, that we pay blacks in the metropolitan area. That would be to pick up historic discrimination and translate it into public to, to, uh, employment. The Denver suit was, in a legal sense, an argument about the design and intent of the city's pay system. On that count, the nurses lost. The judge, issuing a warning as well as a ruling, said the case was pregnant with the possibility of disrupting the entire economy of the U.S. The city's pay system, he concluded, was not discriminatory. I don't think even my own daughters today would feel that, that I am sexist in any way and that the world they live in is necessarily sexist. Not the decision in our case reflects the, the tendency of the courts to, to respond to initiatives by men better than they do initiatives by women. We've had this saying, it's not a good thing to be a black man in a white man's court. And it's not good to be a woman in a male-dominated court either. But I don't feel there's any shortage of promotional opportunities for women or any other group today, they're all being paid the same, and uh, we can get into comparable worth, which could be patently ridiculous. When you say that you lost in this, you lost by losing at the federal level, the appellate level, and you didn't get review by the Supreme Court, you did lose. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of people now that know about comparable worth that maybe never thought about it before. The fact that a tree trimmer makes more money than a nurse does. Teachers could go home and have babies and come back and teach. Nurses can move from here to California and get a job overnight. Uh, they don't have to wait around as men do for jobs very often. Uh, librarians can move from one library to another and their skills are right there. And so uh, there had to have been reasons why women chose these in terms of their professions. To pay women may cost more, but it may not. The same argument was made about slaves. You pay slaves, it's going to run the country into ruin. You pay children, it's going to run the country into ruin. You ought to be able to not pay them anything. How we come last to women is a curious irony. That we should now, after we're beginning to pay everybody else a working wage, have to turn around and face the most significant companion any of us have had, as men at least, and figure out we have, that we have to value them equally and pay them a wage. What you must be thinking after all of this is, what do we do? How can we compare jobs? How can we be more equitable in our salary setting? Interestingly enough, this is not just a male-female issue. Job evaluation, job descriptions, and comparisons have been used for more than 50 years in this country. It's estimated that half of all managers have their jobs evaluated already, so why not evaluate everyone, both men and women, and adjust salaries accordingly? Already, we've heard of major utilities, banks, 
Insurance companies, manufacturers who are doing just that. Uh, they're using valid, reliable, bias-free methods to evaluate and compare jobs. Our own survey of large employers shows that most of them are interested in the concept of comparable worth. They're using consultants. They're starting to look at their pay systems to take them out of the dark ages. So it can be done. It's being done. But the lessons tonight are not really the how-tos or the who-done-its. The point that Owen Johnson and other employers are trying to drive home is that few of us understand, much less appreciate, the economic system, the market which sets our salaries. And on that point, of course, Mr. Johnson is right. We are a nation of economic illiterates. On the other hand, those who herald the marketplace as a theoretical model often forget the inequities therein. Many women have come a long way. Most women have not, not by a long shot. And we men, however enlightened and sensitive we think we may be, still have a long way to go. I'm Dave Moore.